given um, uh, more to the acts of the heart um, than the act of, of, of the body. So uh, when we talk about salah, for example, Rasulullah sallam said al khushu' ruh salah that the spirit of salah is khushu'. Um, um, and uh, we must also understand that um, that if our heart is not present when we do this act of ibadat, then the value of this ibadah is, is has been reduced uh, uh, to a very low level. So. The simplicity of al ibadah was the way Allah explained how should we do things and the way Rasulullah sallallahu explained to us how to worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so you can see it very clearly, very easily that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very easy um, when he talked about wudu and hajj and siyam. Only four verses in the Quran talk about siyam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi number of a hadith explains to us what siyam is about. Um, fiqh always answered the question of civilization, does not build civilization. So when we are moving in our life doing things, then you get a job somewhere when there's no Muslim community and now it's Jummah, what would you do for Jummah? Then you go and ask someone, so I'm, I'm this you know, city, uh, I don't know any Muslim, I, I did not pray Jummah because there's nobody to pray Jummah with, what should I do? This is a practical question we should address and, and talk about. But unless it happens, there's no point to raise the question. So, um, fiqh is meant to be easy. Uh, the whole religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حرج. Whenever there's haraj, hardship, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides ease. Um, so, uh, with this, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, I, I remember also the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he sent um, uh, his sahaba to Yemen, he said, Make things easy and don't make things very difficult on people because the objective is not to make things hard or difficult for us. Islam should not be a source of troubles or hardship. Rather, it should be a source of ease um, um, and um, full submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, um, having said that, uh, I just want to emphasize the fact that we are not going to go so deep and discuss everything in the books of fiqh. Um, there are plenty of things that very much unrelated to our time, right? So there's no point to, to address these things. There's no need for it. Um, I remember I, I maybe have told some of you that I, um, when I was in Oxford attending many beautiful lectures and very you know, deep thinking and highly intellectual people and experts uh, related to Islam one way or the other. And when I went to pray Jummah, uh, the whole khutbah was about how to relieve yourself in the bathroom. And among the things mentioned was to use, the sunnah is to use four stones to wash yourself. And if you don't find three stones, then you can use, you know, or if the three stones are not enough, then you can use the fourth one. And you should not face the qibla when you're sitting on. What, what is talking about? We don't use stones anymore, right? Unless someone, you know, decided to live in the desert, then it's a different story. So, I mean, things that, like this, we are not going to discuss because simply there's no point. If someone in a very unlikely condition then went through something like this, then we can, we can, we can answer his question. And um, as I said also that the, the, the fuqaha's job is to identify, and this is my humble observation, identify and protect the limits, hudud. Right? As I mentioned, the example of the face, wash your face, what, is, what are the limits of the face? Oh, so they have to talk about the, to define face, and these are the limits, and this is what you need to do. And, um, so they, they are very specific sometimes, and one wonders wh wh where they get this from. Allah said, wash your face, just need to water and wash your face. Yeah, this is a <laughs> you don't have to explain further how to wash your face, what are the limits of the face. I mean, but. Again, um, we cannot blame them for doing that, but um, we also have the right to um, uh, simplify things as we need it. Um, number three, um, the, the talking about the spiritual and ethical aspects of ibadat is extremely important. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said when he talked about siyam, for example, Allah said why he wants us to fast when he said, so the main idea for all this fiqh of fasting is to achieve taqwa. So if you do every 
everything perfectly correct and you don't have taqwa as a result of fasting, then we miss the point, right? Although we have done everything legally correct, but we did not get the result, um, uh, which is called the objective of, of siyam. The main objective is to have taqwa. How to do things should be easy and simple, right? <coughs> We, inshallah, will also talk about the adhkar and the du'as uh, affiliated with other acts of worship. Inshallah, we'll, we're working on it. We'll, we'll, we'll print it. Inshallah, we'll collect them. And inshallah, we'll, it will be available, I hope, inshallah, by next week uh, or the week after. Um, so we know uh, the kind of adhkar and du'as we do at the time of prayer and when we come to the masjid and during ruku or sujood or when we pray with her, the adhkar that Rasulullah used to say. Um, it's useful sometimes to know the differences of opinions um, um, for, for, for a good reason, not for, to debate, uh, but rather to explain why our great ulama differed or they have different views on a particular point, uh, where this disagreement came from, for us just to uh, try to expand our understanding of how the uh, fiqh dynamic works. So, not, not with the intention of, of, again, explaining every madhab and every point, but rather to help us understand why these great ulama have different uh, opinions. Traditionally, fiqh al-ibadat start with, uh, what we're going to talk about uh, mainly salah and zakah. When it comes to siyam, we usually, before Ramadan, we hold workshops. Before hajj, we also hold a workshop every year. So, we are going to talk about Salah and Zakah. But before we talk about Salah, we have to talk about something else. You remember what it is? Always the first thing in, the, in every book of Fiqh. Tahara, right? Right? Tahara, purification. What a beautiful word. We start with purification, how to purify ourselves. Again, Fiqh focus on the physical purification. Ulama of Tazkiyah, they talk about purifying your soul or your heart, this different story. And we need, again, as I said uh, today, we need to have both or study both how to purify ourselves physically and spiritually. Um, fiqh, uh, is, uh, we can divide fiqh into two main parts. One is ibadat and mu'amalat. Um, ibadat, we talk about fiqh, salah, siyam, zakah, and hajj, and mu'amalat, everything else, every aspect of our life, right? In the personal level or the personal law, or Muslim family law, we talk about uh, khutbah and, 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 and uh, marriage and, and rights and responsibilities and divorce, um, custody, all these things. And when it comes to business, there are different um, um, things to address and to study, um, haram um, uh, transactions and halal transactions. There are so many details on this. And then the fiqh al-qisas, or the criminal law, as we call it, criminal law, and the civil law, and the con contract law, international law, war and peace, and all these things are um, um, under fiqh al-mu'amala. There are now some schools of thought, they, they, they suggest that instead of starting all the time with the fiqh al-ibadat, simplify it, and let's talk about fiqh al-mu'amala more, because we really need fiqh al-mu'amala one school of thought, a modern school of thought that says that why is that every book of fiqh start with tahara, salah, salah, zakah, and hajj. These things should be simple and easy. What we really need in the modern time is fiqh and mu'amalat. If you run business, can you take interest? Um, if you want to hire people, how to write contracts, uh, buying homes, and all these kind of things are, are more um, practical and we something that we really need to, to clarify. But we will go with the traditional and classic way of teaching fiqh. We'll start with um, at tahara um, and uh, as a prerequisite. We'll talk about the prerequisites of salah. One of them is tahara. And uh, when the ulama talk about tahara, they talk about the different kind of water that we can use. What kind of water you need to use. What are the, when you talk about tahara, you have to talk about najasa, right? And what are the things that are concerned najasa and how to purify or to eliminate this najasa. We need to use water. What kind of water should we use? Plenty of details will just get, uh, inshallah, the most important points that, that we think we, we need uh, in, our daily, uh, in our daily life. So we'll start, inshallah, today with 
um, uh, different kinds of water very briefly. We'll talk about what's called leftover, and we will talk also about um, a najasa. What are the najasat? We might not reach this this point today, so inshallah next week we'll, we we will continue, and then after this we'll uh, talk about wudu and ghusl and so on. And I hope if you have question, you can write it down or you can ask in the end. But this will be strictly related to the subject of this particular week. I know you have maybe millions of questions, but I want you to come every week, basically. So if you have some questions about Salah, something that we're not going to talk about today, come next week and ask the question in the right time. So we'll talk about the water that we use to purify ourselves. When we talk about, um, I said, as I said, tahara, we talk about najasa. There's two terminology that I want to talk about before we get uh, into the subject. Something called al al hadath wal khabath. Khabath means the substance, the impure stuff that we have to eliminate. We'll talk about them in details, right? That like urine, for example, um, or blood. We'll talk more about this. This is called khabath. Right? If this khabath is somewhere, we have to clean it. And there's something called hadath. Hadath is not necessarily attached with khabath. And when you talk about hadath, we are talking about the um, uh, ritual uh, status that we are in. And the hadath can be divided into two parts. One is hadath asghar and hadath akbar. Minor hadath and major hadath. To explain this, it, uh, assume someone who got a very good shower, right? And, uh, so many soap and shampoos and, and what have you, creams and everything. He came out of this bathroom, you know, very clean. And he went and, and he took a nap on the couch or something. And he woke up. Can he pray? Can he pray? Why? Is there any khabath? There's no khabath, right? But there's hadath. And this hadath is hadath asghar, minor hadath. In other words, to eliminate this hadath, he has or she has to make wudu. This is not to say this impurity on his body, but because he went to sleep, um, then, then he cannot pray. He needs to eliminate this hadath. By doing what? By making wudu. Right? Um, and th this hadath asghar. So if you lost your wudu for any reason, then you have to eliminate this hadath by being pure again and, and, and ready to pray. So, wudu, actually one of the definitions of wudu is izalat al-hadath al-asghar. By making wudu, we're doing tahara, why? There's nothing impure here, you know. My body is clean, everything is clean, you know. But it's not about physical cleanliness. It's about um, being in a, in a state that allows you to stand before Allah and pray, right? So, to eliminate the minor hadath, is to make wudu. And if you lose your wudu, then you have hadath. Right? So you have to make another wudu to pray the next prayer. Hadath al-akbar, or the major hadath, is to be eliminated through ghusl. Right? So because it's bigger, then you have to do a bigger thing. And this um, uh, hadath akbar uh, is uh, as a result of janaba. Um, janaba, um, and we'll talk more about janaba, mainly we'll talk about sexual intercourse or um, the monthly period of menstruation for, for, for women, or the post-birth um, uh, bleeding, or nifas, uh, when, when the time comes and for the sisters to be able to pray again, then they have to take shower in order to be able to pray again. Cannot pray even if the blood stopped, right, unless they take this shower. Or when a man, um, or um, a young man, unmarried, so like what we call it, like um, a wet dream, Right? So this is a good reason for him or her to be within this Hadath Akbar, right? So to eliminate this Hadath Akbar, they have to take shower. We'll talk more about this. I'm just giving you some examples. So one of the prerequisites to pray is to make sure that your body, you, the place in which you pray um, is, is clean and you don't have Hadath Asghar or, or Akbar. So that's why starting by talking about water is, is very relevant. So what kind of water we should use to purify ourselves? There are two kinds of water. Water is tahir, 
and water that is tahur. Tahir and tahur. What is the difference between the two? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talked about rain, he said, tahura. So which one is better? The tahir or the tahur? Tahur, right? What is the difference between the two? The tahur water is the water that is pure in itself and can purify something else. But the tahir water is the pure water, but it cannot purify something else. In other words, you, it's tahir, it is pure, but you cannot use to eliminate hadath asghar or hadath akbar. You cannot use for wudu or for ghusl. We'll give some examples, inshallah. So, but now we understand the difference between the two. So, the ma or the water that we use for wudu or for ghusl, it must be ma tahur. Okay, let's talk now about different kinds of water. The first kind of water the fuqa talk about is called al ma al mutlaq. Ma al mutlaq is what comes to your mind when you talk about water. We talk about water that we can bring, we can use to take shower and, and cook, and this is the absolutely good water. Water that does not change its color, its uh, odor, or its, um, what else? Taste. All right? So this is called Ma'amut. Like we're talking about the ocean, sea, rivers, rain, wells. Um, we talk about uh, snow, because snow is, is water, but it's frozen, right? So. If you get some snow and you, yeah, you wait until it liquidizes it, then, then you can use for for shower. In fact, Rasulullah used to make this dua, and we always make it when someone passes away. Allahumma asilum al khataya wa bil ma' wa thalj wa al barad. What's al barad? No. No. Okay, close. That's something you hear about in the news. For the hail, right? So, so the Prophet said, Allah, Allah wash him with water, ma, clean, pure, ma, thalj, thalj means snow, snow or ice, no big difference, the same, right? Well, barad, the hail. All these things are come from nature, they are clean and they are pure, and you can drink, you can use for all these things. And of course, uh, the, the water of the ocean, as we mentioned in the hadith today, Rasulullah said about the sea, huwa tahuru ma'uhu al hillu maytatuhu. When people ask him, can we use this salty water for wudu and, and ghusl? Can, is this water tahur or not? Because it's salty. So Rasulullah said, yes, it is tahur. Huwa tahuru ma'uhu. He talked about the sea, his at tahuru ma'uhu, whose water is tahur, not just tahir, it's tahur. It's more powerful. وَالْحِلُّ مَيْتَتُهُ The dead animals that come from the ocean, it's dead, but you can eat. This is the exception. Every dead animal is haram, except the dead animal that comes from the sea. Um, I know maybe some of you don't eat shrimp. I do, personally, because of this beautiful hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said about the ocean, that's whatever comes out of it is, tahu, uh, is, is halal. Um, um, so, um, I don't want to get into this now. Uh, how about the water, that stagnant water? Sometimes in, there are small lakes in deserts or oases or, 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 or um, forests or jungles. and You have water and this water came, the rain, and stays there for so long. Is it still mutlaq or not mutlaq? Yes, it is. Because staying for so long, maybe it will taste different, maybe it'll smell a little different, but as long as there's nothing impure, um, change it, then it remains in its natural um, uh, uh, description or, or nature. All right, so the first kind of water is al-ma al-mutlaq, the absolute water. Um, we talk about the ri rivers and, and these creeks and, and all this water that's still mutlaq um, water. Now, uh, the second kind of water that Fuqaha talk about so much and have different opinions on it is al-ma'al mustamal, used water. When someone uses water to make wudu, and this water that he uses f falls in a container or something, or 
in the, in the bathroom. Can we reuse it? When we use water for shower, and this water is gathered somewhere, can we reuse it for another wudu or another ghusl? If you stay in the bathtub, you know, and then make your wudu and you leave, and later on you lose your wudu, can you use this water again that you took shower with? Huh? Oh, we have some fuqaha said no. Right? Any other <laughs> opinions? Some people say 10% soap. 10% what? More than 10%. What do you mean? Soap. Or oh, we didn't come to this yet. Well, I'm talking about the pure, clean, tahur water that we use for wudu or ghusl. Can we reuse it? Different opinions. Imam Shafi said yes, of course, and Imam Malik also because you are pure, you are clean, your body is clean. And the Prophet said, Al Mu'min la yandus. The believer never comes or, or never becomes impure. Uh, one of the Sahaba, he saw the Prophet and he hid from him and went home. The so, Prophet you know, didn't know what, what do you do that? You see the Prophet, you go and shake hands with the Prophet. What? So he saw him later in the message said, what, what happened to you? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I was junub. It's Hadith Akbar. And I felt that it's inappropriate to go and shake hands with you while I am najis. He said, no, 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 don't say that. Al-Mu'min la yandus. A believer cannot become impure. So our body is pure and clean. Even the mushrikeen, Allah said about the mushrikeen, innama al-mushrikuna, najas. Najas means impure. Najasa, right? So, no, the ulama said, no, this najasa is not physical najasa, rather spiritual najasa. And the Sahaba and the Prophet himself used to mix with kuffar, touch them all the time, and never said that if you touch a kafir, then you have to go and take shower or make wudu or something like this, right? So, and mu'min lam, just so their argument is that what's wrong with that? If you put your hand in the water and use it for wudu, and this water comes back, what, what's wrong? What, what causes the impurity of the water? Why is that we cannot reuse it? And other ulama said, no, uh, it's, uh, Imam Malik said it's, it's makru, which means disliked, to reuse it if you have other water. But if you don't have any other water, then there's nothing wrong in using it. As I said, this happens sometimes when, when we use our uh, bathtub. You know, this water here, you used it, and still warm, <laughs> can we use it again? Or maybe your husband or your wife want to use it after you. So, can we use it? The uh, majority of the alama is with open yes, because nothing, you know, changed the nature of water. Because our body is clean, um, and and it should be okay to use it because still ma uh, tahur. Two other kinds of water: the water mixed with pure stuff or elements and Water, the fourth one is the water that mixed with impure things. So number three is the water that is mixed with things that um, are pure. Like what? In the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when his daughter Zainab passed away, he told the women who are washing her body, um, put some kafur and in the end add some sidr. These are kind of uh, leaves that smells smells good. If you go um, in Saudi Arabia, for example, for Omar or Hajj, and you go to any um, one of these stores that sell these herbs and things, and you, all these names are still used there. So, in other words, he said, add this to the water that you use to wash her body, and this makes the body smells good, right? So the ulama said, from this, if something added to the water that's pure in of itself and did not change the, how the water looks or taste or, 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 or smell, then it is still clean and pure water. Uh, another hadith that Rasulullah used to take shower with, with his wife, Maymuna, uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a container uh, that's mixed with da. So they use it to cook their food and then the, the same container, they don't have millions of containers like we do have now. Just one thing they use to prepare the, the you know, dough, and then they, they use it for shower. They put water in it, and they say the ajin uh, it's still visible inside. So there's a percentage of this dough, but it did not change the nature of water, because the water is larger, much larger than 
this uh, substance. These substances are clean and pure, and they're not overwhelming, overwhelming is uh, the, the nature of water. What if someone puts so much uh, wheat in the water, and it became like milky, it looks like milky water because of this uh, soap, for example, so much soap or shampoo, and then you look, and you see all these foams, and you know, it smells very good. It's nice to take shower with this, but this water becomes tahir, but not tahur. So if you add something of these things on the water that did not significantly change, according to the hadith of the Prophet um, when he talked about those who, uh, ladies who were washing his daughter, if they add something, uh, even if it changed the smell a little bit, but the water, the majority of the water is still um, um, water, you can call it water, then, then we can use this um, water. Um, this is not to say that some ulama did not say that, no, you cannot. Some ulama said, no, you cannot use this water because now, since one of the three um, uh, qualities of water changed, خلاص, this water is still tahir, but it's not tahur anymore. So some ulama so of just if you want to stay on the safe side, um, you know, um, make sure that the little bit of, of whatever you add to the water is not overwhelming, it's not so much. Because of the hadith of the Prophet um, that he told them to add Sidr and Kafur to this water, right? So, at this point, clear. Okay, the fourth one is the water that's mixed with Najasa. Are two kinds, different, uh, different, two different kinds. One is this: if this najasa is added to a small amount of water, and if this najasa is added to a huge amount of water, the first kind, all the elements, it's najis. If you have a container and your son or daughter sit on it and he did it there, it's not that much. So the whole water is najis, right? But what if the najasa? is very small comparing to amount, the amount of water. The ulama said that it is still pure and clean. Um, again, as long as it did not change the taste, the color, or the odor of the water. It happens sometimes in the, you know, some wells that are not very deep. And um, someone you know, throws uh, uh, you know, something that's impure there. Does it change the whole world? We cannot use it. No, we can. We still can use it. Um, if um, someone urinated in, in a running water, if it's not like a big river, but a small river or a creek, but someone, or stream, urinated in it. This does not turn the whole water because the amount of impurity is very small comparing to the amount of fresh and clean, and clean um, uh, water. And we all know the story of the Bedouin guy who came to the Prophet's Masjid and he urinated in the side of the Masjid, right? I like this hadith. You know, every time I try to imagine if someone did it today, maybe he has mental illness or something, well, it happens. I mean, I don't know what would happen to him. But it did happen in the time of Prophet And this Bedouin, you know, Bedouins, they live in the desert. And this is what they do. You know, you, you want to do it? They do it. Just get out of his tent and do it. Every, everywhere is an open bathroom. Right? And, and he did the same. He felt he won't do it to the side in the masjid and did it. And people start running after him. So just leave him, leave him, just let him finish. You know, it, it's not healthy to just cut him off in the middle. Let him finish it. And of course, if they run after him, and if he runs everywhere, then <laughs> he goes more majasa in the masjid. So I'll just let him do it in one place. And he said, "Innama bu'ithum muyassirin." He told his sahaba when he saw them just about to attack this guy. He said, "Innama bu'ithum muyassirin, walam tubathu muassirin." You have been sent as a good community that makes things easy for people, that treat people with kindness. Let him finish, and when he's done. Just pour a bucket of water on it, that will take care of it. This is how you clean, uh, you know, the, the ground. At that time, there's no carpet like, like now, you know, it's, it's just you know, sand. And 
So uh, the point here is that there is an adjacent and there is a bucket, the prostrum dalwan or the loop, the loop that contains a lot of you know water, like you talk, are talking about maybe four or five gallons of water, something like this. So if the pure clean water is greater in in uh, in size than the impurity, all right. So you can you can imagine you know a urine of of, of uh, an adult and a bucket of water. Of course, a bucket of water is like maybe ten times more. Right, so this will take care of it. So, so the point here is that if an adjacent uh, mixed with pure clean water and the amount of water is much larger than this adjacent, so we can still use this uh, this water. Bi'r um, Buda, this is a very famous bi'r uh, in Medina, um, that sometimes people throw like. Uh, someone got like a dead cat or something, they go and throw it in this. Can we make wudu from this way, Ya Rasulullah? They ask him, said, yes. In other words, if the water is large in number, nothing will affect the purity of water. So, um, very quickly, four kinds of water, the absolute water, the water of rivers, seas, and um, lakes, and uh, ice, snow, uh, hail, um, even stagnant water mixed with, uh, uh, you know, leaf trees and, and, and algae and, and all these kind of things does not change it. The used water, again, some one said, no, you cannot use it. Others said, you can use it. Some said, if, if you have any other water, that it's, it's disliked to, 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 to use it. Um, the third one, that, that the water mixed with pure stuff, right? So, again, if it's not so much, it did not change any of the characteristics of the water, then you still can use it. And we mentioned the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, to a hadith. And the water mixed with impurity, if the impurity is, is so much and the amount of water is, is, is not that much, then it's, it's impure altogether. But if the najasa is very little and the water is so much, then uh, water is still um, clean. Any questions here before we go forward? Okay. Yes. I don't know if this is related or not. But I will tell you. If it's not related, I'll tell you it's not related. And the fabric <laughs> is dry. What fabric? Oh. Closed oh. the place. Uh huh. Is it? Is it okay? What do you mean? Do you have to do wash it with water? Next week, inshallah. Come next week. <laughs> I can't give you an answer now, but I want. Yeah, All right. The water color can change because the leaves or the, the chemistry of the land itself. Yeah, if, when the water mixed with the land itself, leaves, these things are pure and clean, does not change the, the, the nature of water. This is actually still not mutlaq. And I will even talk about the water that we can call stagnant. Yani, it happens in, in, in when the rain comes down. It, you can see these little lakes here and there. Sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller. Sometimes they're deep, sometimes they're shallow. But again, when they mix with leaves, with uh, wood, with you know, all these clean and pure natural things, it's still uh, uh, clean and, and, and pure. Yes, and the, the ulama who, who said, yes, it's okay, they have this rational thinking that because our body is clean and pure, um, so everything is pure unless it's proven otherwise. Number, number two, they said that there's a hadith that Rasulullah would um, um, uh, use the water on his hand to wipe on his, on his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, and some sahaba, radiallahu anhum, they used to take water that's hanging on their beard, okay, and, and use it to wipe on their head. So, used water for this reason is, is okay uh, for this rational and textual um, uh, evidence. Yes? Are there special circumstances if there's disease in an area to avoid reusing water then? Well, um, th this. Uh, uh, this is to be looked at from hygienic perspective because because sometimes we mix between what's tahur and what could be 
um, um, uh, health safety issue. So if you think this water, this, this again, it's common sense now, uh, you know, there's nothing in fiqh say that you cannot shake hands with someone who has flu, right? But it's, it's common sense. So if you think this particular water is a potential, um, you know, harm to you, then don't use it. If you think the one who used it before who ha has some viral infection or has some thing yet, it makes a lot of sense not to use it. Not because necessarily it's not tahur, because virus is not, <laughs> is not impure as far as I know. I don't know if the Alamah started this. But, but again, to avoid illness is an Islamic thing. That's why Rasulullah um, um, told some people, uh, told his, his, his community that if you hear about the plague somewhere, don't go to this place. And if it happened where you are, don't leave. So the point is to limit the disease. So, now. Yes, yes. I know there are some chemicals and some things added to it, but it does not change the nature of water. If you allow me, you made me thirsty now. But some of the public restrooms when you go, it has like some bitter taste to it. Sometimes you can feel it, and then it's uh, a little brownish also. It varies from one city to the other. In, in, in England, for example, um, the water is called heavy water. It has a lot of minerals. Um, and it tastes different. Uh, to me, it was horrible. I didn't like it. Right? I drink it only when I have to. I'm very thirsty. It is the only thing available. Um, but this, again, this does not change the nature. We can still call this absolute water. Yes. I will give prayer to those who sit in front. This is the sun, actually, to stay close. But uh, if there's nobody in front, I'll, then I'll take the... Okay, you have one? Okay, so, ala qarbuna awla bil ma'roof. What do you mean? You, that those who are close have more right. Okay. Uh, treated treatment water, that like uh, sewage water and it's treated and then it comes out pure. Right, you don't look at the, where it came from, you look at it now. Is it clean and pure, uh, absolute, drinkable? The, if the answer is yes, halas. It is clean and, and pure. Don't, in fiqh, in general, you don't look at the origin of things. Because it's something called istihala. Istihala means, um, how do you, istihala, the change. Uh, when, you're, when something changed, the nature of a thing, changed from one thing to the other. Like wine, for example. If wine transformed into, um, what do you call this, did you add, huh? Vinegar. Vinegar. Naturally. It's vinegar. What is this? It's vinegar. Can we use it? Of course you can use vinegar. But it was, forget about what it was, right? And this applies to many, so many things. And I will say something just for you to think about it. Uh, this gelatin that we have in many chocolates and many foods, uh, different food, cookies, and even some medicine and vitamins, I attended a fiqh, um, um, council conference in Stockholm, this was in 2003, and a bunch of ulama and a bunch of Muslim scientists. And one of these scientists passed away three days ago. His name is Ahmed al-Hawari, rahimahullah. He was the scientific consultant of the European Council of Fiqh. When something scientific happens, he goes and explains to the scholars why it is. And I remember very well, I was sitting with him on, on a dinner table, and dinner time and we're talking about this subject and he said from from chemical perspective I can assure you 100% I have the chemical what you call the chemical composition, composition? Yeah. okay I'm not uh, okay. All right he said it goes from one stage to the other right there are three main stage this gelatin it's coming from gelatin but it's totally different substance so to him it's not haram at all Think about this, I'm not giving fatwa, but this goes to the question that was raised. And he applied this principle of istihala, when something changed from one thing to the other, totally different. They have to write it, they have to write it in the ingredients, they have, they have to write gelatin. But, but this substance that's added to this particular product has nothing to do with the animal gelatin, whatsoever. 
And to him, from fiqh perspective, from scientific perspective, he said, Wallahi, it is totally the fun thing. And he, and, and he looked at it very closely. So but the principle itself, the concept of istihara on something, change something else, it takes a new ruling. Allahu alam. No question about the gelatin, please. I just give this as an example. No, wine? No, cook with wine is different. But this wine, you said wine. It is wine. No, it's alcohol goes away. When you burn it, alcohol is gone. So no, 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 no. <laughs> no, that's different. Because alcohol or wine is nudges. It's, it's impure, according to many ulama. The majority of the ulama, they, so when you add wine to food, it's impure. So, so it's totally different. It's not only because it intoxicates you, because it's impure. Can you have to use it? What, what, and, but if you use it in, in okay, so, if you, are you saying that if you boil wine, then you can drink it? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's impure, unclean, unclean, yes. The, the wine or the alcohol, in this case, is not used uh, so that you will drink it, but to extract things from the food. Once you heat it beyond a certain point, the whole alcohol disappears. There's no alcohol left, but it has caused some extraction, some things to be taken out of the food so the taste will be different. Okay, so let's now focus, go back to water. <laughs> All right. Any question about water? Okay, go ahead. You know, uh, obviously, a lot of ulamas who gave these kind of uh, fatwas. Uh, what kinds of fatwas? The, the, the fiqh of which you talk about. Okay. They are mostly, I would say, Middle East. Um, the, the yes, yes, East. that's true. So I would think there would be some uh, thought about recycling mm. the water being scarce. Is, th is there anything in there? About recycling, like the second kind of water you suggested, that a lot of homo okay to use, but I would think it would be recommended to reuse the water. No, no, no. Um, the concept of recycling is not there at all. Brothers ask about you, the use of used water, it's the concept of recycle. We know this. all this water is recycled naturally, right? But when they talk about used water, they mainly talk about water used for wudu and ghusl. They're not talking about any other water for any other use. So, so if um, because because some believe that when you use this water to purify yourselves, this water, you know, becomes impure in of itself. And and, and others are doing wrong. There's no reason to believe so. So the concept of recycling, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't. I, it's not mentioned anywhere. Oh, someone will raise his hand here, please. So let's take his, uh, his request first. No, no, no gelatin. No, no. 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 After the class, inshallah, can talk to me about this. Yes. Mm. So all right. Okay, I've never heard of it before, but thank you for the. All right. So the next point I want to talk about briefly, which kind of related to the first one that has to do. Uh, let me finish this, and inshallah, I'll take more questions. That's called a so or, or leftover. In other words, if someone drinks um, from a pot. Um, um, can we use this water? Uh, this happens because some of us have cats at home and some of us also have uh, uh, live near ponds and different kinds of animals go and drink from it uh, or sometimes you have your own containers in the backyard and, and animals come and drink from it your uh, neighbor's dog it happens sometimes so that's why I, I want to talk about it very, very briefly so the leftover um, of, of, of a human, whether Muslim or not Muslim, uh, this water left over you know, um, is, is clean and pure. There's no reason to believe that um, it is impure. Um, um, I know in, in, in Jewish tradition, when woman is uh, in, in menstruating, then the concept of impurity is so large. They cannot eat or... Um, you know, sleep next to them, or, or they can come to the place where the. Uh, 
Yeah, so everything is, you know, in, the Rasulullah said no. When, when he was in Atikaf and his um, home was, like, was, a, was a window, and Aisha Dilan used to comb his hair and, and stuff like that. And, and one day she said, I'm, I'm high. He said, you, you hide your menstruation not in your hand. So in other words, Islam uh, w w reduced this misconception or corrected this misconception. So, so um, the leftover of any human, Muslim, non-Muslim, uh, uh, women in the, the time of menstruation or, or nifas, this water is still pure and clean. The leftover of animals that we eat. Um, can we use this water to for wudu or for ghusl? Yes, because all these animals that we eat um, uh, are, are clean and pure. How about the animals we don't eat? Wolves, tigers, lions, donkeys, dogs. Uh, well, I will keep dogs at the end. You know, forget about dogs now. Um, uh, cats, things that we don't eat. In general, the all the leftover is clean and pure. The only Leftover that's not pure or clean is the leftover of a dog or a pig. These are the two things. The first one, the, the very famous hadith, authentic hadith, Rasulullah said that when when a dog um, um, uh, licks your your plate, uh, okay, wash it seven times, one of which is with with uh, sand or with, with dust. One of these seven it could be the first, the last, the one, anyone in, in, in the middle. Um, and, and again, um, Imam Malik said this is not a delil that the saliva of the dog is is najis. Imam Malik, with the opinion that any living creature, their hair, their saliva, their their uh, when they sweat, um, is all pure and clean, except pigs. So for those who um, uh, have um, their neighbors have dogs or whatever. I know in Hanafi and Shafi it's strictly najasa. The, the, the nose or the saliva of the dog is najis, then you have to wash your pant and whatever it touches. Uh, Imam Malik, he said, no, everything is pure and clean unless Sharia says it's, 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 it's um, impure. And there's nothing in Sharia said the saliva of the dog is impure. And when they quoted this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, wash the, your plate if the dog uh, uh, licked it seven times. Um, he said, no, this, this does not mean it is impure. It means that because of the diseases that could be or potential viruses, and it's just a matter of, of hygienic procedure, not, not uh, impurity. Um, so, so the leftover of the dog is all ulama agree that it's impure because of this hadith. Even Imam Malik said that it is uh, when 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 the dog, you know, drinks from a pot or whatever, then this water is is considered not uh, clean. And of course, of of the pig, that's very obvious, um, and uh, we don't have to talk so much about it. Um, uh, donkeys or mouse or horses and any other wild animals, when they come and drink from uh, um, this water, this the, the leftover is clean. And uh, um, Amr ibn As one day was traveling with Omar al-Khattab and they went to ask, he went to ask the owner of this well, uh, do wild animals in the desert come and drink from this? And Omar said, don't tell us, it's mutakallif, you know, so why, why are we asking this? They get whatever water in their stomach and the leftover is for us to use. So, so in other words, there's no point to uh, believe that this water is not clean. The only uh, impure leftover is the leftover of dog or the pig. And for cats in particular, um, uh, Abu Darda used to have a cat at his home, and when she came to drink and he brought the container near, and he said, I heard Rasulullah Sallam saying, they, they come and they're not like spoiled cats like we have now. They just come from one house to the other. Just like. So this, they are pure and clean. So when they drink from or eat anything in your plate, then the remaining um, of this food or water um, is, is clean. Um, very quickly, um, I just want to talk about uh, 
or you know what, I will keep it for next week. I want our different kind of Najasat, um, um, dead animals, um, blood, and we we'll talk so much about blood, or different opinions, and, um, and the blood of animals, and blood of humans, and uh, is it totally Najis? Is it not Najis? Our blood, how much of blood that uh, break our wudu, that we have to wash, we cannot pray with. Some argue that Sahaba used to get wounded, and the Prophet never said you have to wash your clothes, others said no, them is najis. We'll talk about this uh, next week, inshallah. And many other forms of impurity that we have to purify before we start our prayer. So inshallah, we'll leave this for next week. And now we have 15 more minutes for Q&A and, or comments, if you have uh, any. We'll start with those in front. If nothing, we'll go further. So this is the nearest one. No offense. Come closer if you want. <laughs> I think in, in, in the khutbah you mentioned about <coughs> the rules, the rulings, or, or the, the, uh, the, the, the terms to which, which talk about the ibadah, mm. right? And they are, they are not too many. There they are, they are just few. The verses. The, uh, not just verses. Maybe a mention of book or... or uh, collection of all those things together. Um, if, if I want to just increase my knowledge on that, what would be a, maybe a good book to, for the beginners in terms of levels? Well, uh, if you want to know about this, then you need to study usul al-fiqh, not fiqh. It is fiqh that we talk about now, or ilm al furu'. it's called the furu or the branches, and it's in usul. The usul is like, like the, if you talk about the tree, it is a, the roots and trunk, and then there are branches. So now we are in the branches, in the details. But how to extract a ruling from the Quran and from the Sunnah is called usul al fiqh, totally different science. So, a faqih is not necessarily an usuli, but usulis, most of them are, are fuqaha. Because the usuli is the one who knows the rules that you need to have in, in order to be able to extract rulings from because not everybody can read Bukhari or Muslim or, or Quran can extract rules. That's a very complex process. So the usul is all of the, the, the fundamentals, the principles that you need to have in order to be able to reach a conclusion. The faqih is the one who knows these conclusions. So you ask me, is, it, uh, is the blood uh, pure or impure? No, impure. You have to watch this, otherwise your salah will not be valid. This is the, the hukm, right? But how to reach this hukm? What did you do to reach this hukm? Oh, well, I read Al-Quran. This is what Al-Quran says. I read the many hadith related to this issue, and analyzed them, and I read the different opinions of scholars, and I reached this conclusion. So these are, pro these are manhaj, this is a methodology. That's why our great ulama have different methodologies. And Abu Hanifa has a methodology that's different from Malik, different from Shafi, different from Ahmad. And that's perfectly okay, that's good. Our crisis as a Muslim ummah when it comes to the legal culture is that we stop this tradition. No more. You have to follow one of the four. I will tell you a real story. The story of Abu Zara. Abu Zara is a brilliant student. He, his teacher is Al Balkani. And he asked his teacher, Bukhani, why is that Taj al-Din al-Subki? Taj al-Din al-Subki is called the Shaykh al-Islam. He is one of the greatest Shafi scholars. He's brilliant. His books are, are, are taught in, in, in Islamic schools and Azhar and elsewhere. So Taj al-Din al-Subki is like, is, he said, why is that Taj al-Din al-Subki is not an absolute mujtahid? He's not less than Malik or Shafi or Abu Hanifa. He's as good, if not better than them. He's very intelligent, very smart. Are brilliant, he memorizes tons of hadith, he, he has the tools to be in this level, right? The highest level of scholarship in Islam. So Al-Balqani did not respond. He smiled, and Abu Zara said, you know what, it seems to me that because he will not find a job, and he will not be hired in the judiciary system, and people will not come to him, and he will be accused of are being heretic. Al-Baqani smiled and he nodded like this. This is the only reason. He could not be the fifth 
although he is very much qualified. Alayth ibn Sa'd. Alayth ibn Sa'd who lives in Egypt. Those who wrote about Alayth and Malik, he lived in the same town of Malik and they used to write letters to each other. Very polite, very scientific, very academic. They know that Alayth is, have, has more knowledge than Malik. There are so many scholars in the same level, if not higher than Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Malik, and Ahmad. But the problem, for some reasons, most of them are political, it stopped there and there was some uh, culture, or part of the culture at that time. That's it. You have to follow all of these four. So Tajuddin al-Subki could have been the fifth madhab because he has his own methodology. He agrees and disagrees with these great four, but he has to be a teacher of one of these four. Think about it today. If you are a great scholar living in Saudi Arabia, and you are not Wahhabi, you're not Salaf, you're not Hanbali, and you disagree with Ibn Taymiyyah all the time, you disagree with Sheikh bin Baz all the time, Rahimahullah, you will never be hired as a professor in any of this. You will not be one of the high council of muftis. Nobody will listen to you. You will be outcasted and people will, will damage your, or assassinate your character. You will not find a job. Brothers and sisters always talk about madhahib, it's all, it's all politics and personal interest. Think about it, think about it. If you are the only imam in this area, Troy, Rochester, Rochester Hills, Auburn Hills, um, uh, all this area, you are the only imam, and you are Maliki. And for 20, 30 years, you are the marja. When people have any question, they come to you. You have your own school, you teach, you memorize the Maliki madhab. People come to you for marriage, for problems, for divorce, you are the judge, you are the um, you know, imam, you are the scholar, and all these people come to you. They, send their, they come to a school that you established. Would you be happy to find a great Shafi Imam coming to this area and starting his school? Yes or no? Forget about Taqwa and Brotherhood and all these things. It's non nonsense. The reality is no. You'll be jealous and you'd wish that he gets out of this town because people will leave him and go to that school. This is what it is. It's natural, Akhi. It's, it's, it's like like any other business. It's like any other business. It is a competition, sometimes it gets ugly. Do you know who killed Imam Shafi? The Maliki fanatics in Egypt. He was beaten to death. He was beaten to death because he dared to disagree with Imam Malik, his teacher. And going back to this example of this Maliki guy who, you know, the top of, or the only Imam of this area, um, if this Shafi'i Imam came to this area, believe me, he'll be the first one to assassinate his character. No, 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 if you are Maliki, you cannot be Shafi'i. You have to stick with Maliki. No, 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 you cannot go to him. They are ignorant. The Aqidah is ruined. He does not know fiqh. You stay with me. I don't want to lose my customers. As simple as that. So this idea of if you are Maliki, you have to say Maliki. If you are half, you have to have it. Nonsense. It's nonsense. I wish I can debate someone on this. I'm ready. If you know someone who's willing to debate me on this, Wallahi, I'm 100% ready. Never the Quran said that. Never the Sunnah said that. Never the ulama said that. Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa said, never follow us unless you understand our argument, our dalil. Never even narrate my opinion unless you explain to me why, based on what I made this, this fatwas. They themselves change all the time. They themselves change their opinion all the time. So practically, they did not do that. They, they discourage people from that. It's all political. It's all like competition. It is a competition. You know why Hanafi Madhab is the, the most widespread Madhab? The Hanafi, yeah. Because two dynasties, two caliphates, Abbasids and the Ottomans. And where did this come from? The Abbasids, they pushed and they, they tortured Abu Hanifa to accept the position of being the supreme judge. And he refused. Because he understood, he's very smart. He understood that once I get this high position, this 
great job, my opinion will be influenced by the interests of the king or the Khalifa or whatever. He said, no, I want to be a free thinker. It's a huge pressure, Akhi. His student, Abu Yusuf, accepted the position because Abu Hanifa was wealthy. He has his own business. He, he is, a, is a businessman. He sells, uh, buys and sells silk, clothes. He's wealthy. He used to give scholarship to his brilliant students, including Abu Yusuf. And he said, well, why don't you come really to the class? He said, I have to work my, with my dad. So how much money you make? It's okay, I'll give it to you. Just come. You're a good student. He deserved this scholarship. Abu Hanifa used to give scholarship to his students, brilliant students. 